Okay, so um, good morning all, and it is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the Surefire Live Conference, a platform with a vision of making the pathway to eternal life simple, clear, and available to every humankind. That's what this platform is about. Uh, so I'm very pleased and glad that you are here. Uh, so your participation here, therefore, uh, are twofold. Uh, the participation of all of us are twofold. One is to learn uh, whatever the Holy Spirit will impart to, to us. And then the second is to become an ambassador in sharing this simple message with others. Uh, so please feel free to share the links and uh, the book, the ebook that we shared uh, on the platform. And if you have not joined the WhatsApp platform, please uh, let me know and or Dara at the end of this session so that he will add you. So please feel free to share the message, the links with your friends and families. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channels. Uh, Pastor Godwin and Abia can search me up and uh, subscribe, and uh, the Facebook and Instagram at Rich Pastor Godwin. You will see it on the flyer that was sent to you. Uh, please like, follow, comment, and share us. Uh, this is important, uh, not for any personal reason. Uh, the way the algorithm of the platforms work is that as you continue to build that the number, uh, it, the platform will then promote our content and that will then reach more people, which is our focus and our objective. So please um, do subscribe, like, follow, comment and share. Finally, let me thank all those who joined us last week. It was a great time. I enjoyed the blessing of the Lord, the teaching, who is a Christian, uh, which we now call it, who is a Christian part one, because today we're looking at who is a Christian part two, but beginning to look into looking deeper. Uh, and I also uh, want to thank those who are joining for the first time today. God bless you all and enlarge you and your ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to take the opening prayer now and then we will go straight into the teaching. And at the end of the teaching, we will have discussion, your questions, and we'll bring this then to a conclusion. Let us pray. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for gathering us this moment to yourself. We thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us and washing us by your precious blood. Lord Jesus, you love us so much that you left your glory in heaven and you came down. You laid down your life, died, rose from the dead, and you ascended to heaven where you are seated at the moment at the right hand of God, having all power, all authority, all dominion over all creations of God in heaven and on earth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have sent your Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit of God, our comforter, our teacher, our counselor, for being with us. And right now, we yield ourselves to you. We surrender all to you. And we ask, teach us this moment the truth of God. Teach us the pathway of eternal life. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. So today, 
we want to look at who is a Christian part two. Who is a Christian part two. Let's, uh, and the focus of today is going deeper uh, with the topic receiving and working in the power of the Holy Spirit. Receiving and working in the power of the Holy Spirit. Last week, when we introduced this topic, who is a Christian, which we now title part one, we looked at a number of things, which I will just give a few summary. We made the point that a Christian is one that is just like Christ, not a copy, but similar in nature and in the image of Jesus Christ. That's point one. A Christian is one that is just like Christ, not a copy, but similar in nature and in the image of Jesus Christ. Point two, just for summary, so those who may not, who didn't join us last uh, uh, Sunday can follow. Point two, that Jesus Christ was born in the flesh by the Holy Spirit, and that makes him the Son of God. Jesus Christ was born in the flesh by the Holy Spirit, and that makes him the Son of God. Point three, therefore, for anyone to be like Christ, to be like Jesus Christ, which is the uh, true meaning of a Christian, as we already made in point one, then that person must be born of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit by whom Christ was born. The same Holy Spirit that filled Jesus Christ, the same Holy Spirit by whom Jesus did all the works and fulfilled the purpose of God for his life. We then made the point uh, by sharing a simple model, a simple model that we shared, which we call BRRBL, BRRBL. You remember that model? A simple model to summarize a Christian or who a Christian is or what it means to be a Christian, BRRBL, covering the, um, the entire scope of what it is, how you can become a Christian and the life that uh, one should live as a Christian, B-R-R-B-L. And that stands for belief, belief repent, repent, believe, become, and become, live. And live. Excellent. Thank you very much. So that model, believe God and his son Jesus Christ, repent of sin, receive the Holy Spirit, and become a son and daughter of God, a son or daughter of God, then live by faith and love in accordance and obedience to the word of God till you translate this world, till we translate this world and continue to enjoy eternal life, which God has provided for us as his sons and daughters. So when you receive when you receive Jesus Christ, uh, you believe Jesus Christ, you repent, you receive the Holy Spirit, you become a child of God, and you have received eternal life. First John chapter 5, verse 11 says, This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son, has life. He that does not have the Son of God has no life. It's that simple. Eternal life has been given to us. So today, we want to focus on this 
go deeper in that R and B, R and B, receiving the Holy Spirit and becoming a son or daughter of God. So if you look at that model, B, R, R, B, L. I think last week we focused more on the B and R because we did summarize the steps to go to become a Christian um, and focus more on the B and R. That's believing and repenting. Now we want to go deeper in receiving and becoming because it is in the becoming that we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. So I want to take our texts of this topic today from the book of Luke chapter 24 verse 49. The book of Luke chapter 24 verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. This was the statement that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ made to his disciples before his ascension to heaven. This was after his death. If you read this scripture, say from verse 46, you see the discourse there. The Bible talks about, it said, Jesus Christ opened their understanding. He opened their understanding to know the things that were written concerning him, Christ, how he would die and rose from the dead, and through that repentance and forgiveness of sin might be given to all mankind. And then he left this last word. He said, but you, disciples, tarry in Jerusalem till the promise of the Father comes upon you and you will receive power. What is this promise of the Father? The Holy Spirit. And this brings another key point. As I made categorical statement last time, I said, all Christians are disciples of Jesus Christ, but not all disciples of Jesus Christ are Christians. Because only one thing makes a person a Christian, and that is the Holy Spirit. So you see here, Jesus Christ, having finished his work, came out of the resurrected from the dead. But he told the disciple, it is time to enter into the dispensation of the sons and daughters of God. And that is only possible by the Holy Spirit. So you're going to wait till the Holy Spirit comes. And of course, you know that this is exactly uh, the scripture that continues in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. You can see, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But you see the problems with disciples who haven't translated, uh, translated and become Christians. They were still waiting for the earthly kingdom. They were still waiting to follow rules and regulations. So look at the verse 6, the question they ask. He said, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That was your own interest. Oh, Jesus, you have now overcome death. So, will you now haven't taken authority over the devil, over every enemy. You have come out of the dead. Nobody has ever done that. Will you at this time now 
restore the kingdom to Israel. Know that by this time, the nation of Israel was under the Roman Empire. So you can understand why they asked the question. They were looking for earthly dominion. And that is where some people are still preaching today and they are deviating. They are missing the heavenly goal. What Jesus wants us to focus on is eternal life. And we have received that eternal life when we receive the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that is in Christ Jesus. As I said before, this is one that no man can fake. Nobody can cajole this one because it's only given by God himself through his son, Jesus Christ. It's either you receive the spirit or you have not received the spirit. We continue in verse uh, seven. See what Jesus answered them. He had to bring them back in line to this truth. And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Almighty God help us today to experience this power of the Holy Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. So we're talking about receiving the Holy Spirit and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, into me, into a person, let me make this point clear. The Holy Spirit manifests himself in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God. You can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says a whole lot about that. We will come to that. The Holy Spirit also manifests himself, manifests through the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, which is the righteousness of God. So one who has the spirit of God in him, by the spirit will manifest the fruit. That's why Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. The righteousness of God is by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit also helps us and manifests himself through acceptable services to God. Acceptable services to God. That is the ministry the ministry. Every one of us has a ministry. Services that are acceptable to God. Services that will please God. God has put in you gifts, talents. And as you have received the Holy Spirit, he helped, the Holy Spirit helps you to serve God in a way that is pleasing to God. That's your ministry. Anything that God will put in your heart by his spirit to do in order to please God. And we please God by serving humanity. You can check that in Matthew chapter 25 from verse 31. You will see what I call the works of mercy. The works of mercy, where Jesus Christ said that he will separate the goat, the sheep, and the goat. The sheep will be on his right hand and the goat on his left hand. And he will say to the sheep, Enter the joy of your father, just paraphrasing. He said, I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was in prison, you visited me. 
He said, I was homeless, you took me in. He continued, think listed six key things there. And he said, the righteous will say, ah, Lord, where did we see you naked and we brought you in? Homeless, uh, naked we clothed you rather. Homeless and we brought you in. In prison and we visited you. Hungry and we fed you. And he said, he will answer them and say, as much as you did it to the least of this, my brethren, the least of this one, you did it for me. So your acceptable services, the Holy Spirit helps you to do acceptable services. And by the way, this is one key judgment of God that many people are not talking about. I think as we go on, there are many things God will help us to share. I will be talking about the key judgments of God. This is one of them. The judgment standards of God. So you can see there, he said he would divide the sheep and the goat. And he set the criteria for dividing those who did acceptable services, which is by the Holy Spirit. And finally, the Holy Spirit helps you in your personal communion with God, your personal fellowship with God, the communion of the Holy Spirit. So it is imperative that we seek the Holy Spirit earnestly and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. So with this understanding, how does one receive the Holy Spirit? I did make the point that it doesn't take fasting for 21 days to receive the Holy Spirit. Actually, it doesn't take any fasting at all to receive the Holy Spirit. What it takes to receive the Holy Spirit is understanding of, and faith. And this is the essence of this teaching, understanding and faith. So let's look at the Bible, the scripture, if run through a few scriptures let's step back to um jesus talking to his disciples and talking to the jews in john chapter 14 verses 14 through 18 to see the promise of god in verse 14 he says if you ask anything in my name i will do it 15 if you love me keep my commandments and i will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. He said, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Please pause there and just leave that scripture in. Let, let me try to unravel a, a, a bit of a mystery here. And I pray the Almighty God keeps opening our eyes. When you think about it, it's easy to always say that Jesus Christ came, completed his work, he went to heaven, and God sent his Holy Spirit, which is true. But how do you understand the fact that Jesus Christ himself, to come to this earth, he came through the Holy Spirit of God. I want you to think about that. But let's bring that into the context of the scripture. So prior to Jesus' ascension to heaven, the Holy Spirit visited men. And I think we will look at one of those men in the Old Testament. He will visit men, but he never dwells continually in men. He will visit men, help men, they prophesy as the Holy Spirit gave them enablement ability. They did great works like the prophets of old. But in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwell in fullness. Of course, he was born of the Holy Spirit. So 
Jesus here was telling his disciples of what will happen. And remember in the book of Joel, it has already been prophesied that in the latter days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So Jesus was speaking to the disciples here, telling them this dispensation, we have men, people, flesh, will be baptized in the Holy Ghost and they will carry that Holy Spirit presence till the day we leave this world, till the day Jesus will come to judge the world if we are still alive by that time. So Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. He said, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. He said, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Who was speaking here? Jesus Christ was speaking. Can you point, can you see the mystery of God here being unraveled? Jesus was the one speaking physically to the disciple about the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send, as you can see in verse 16. But then he said, whom the Father will send in his name. But then he said that you have seen him and you know him. Who were they seeing? Who did they know? It was Jesus they saw. It was Jesus they knew. Yet Jesus was telling them about the Holy Spirit and said that they have seen him and they have known him. Hallelujah. This is the mystery of God, the oneness of God. So Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. When I go, I will come to you by the Holy Spirit. And so when you have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus in you. When you have the Holy Spirit, you have God in you. Let's quickly look at the scripture in the book of John chapter 16. Again, Jesus emphasized this same point. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Why couldn't they bear them then? Because the Holy Spirit was not yet given to them. He said, however, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, the Spirit of God has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take a word is mine and declare it to you. Beloved, I make it the emphasis again, no one is a Christian if he does not have the Holy Spirit. And no one can be like Christ except he has received the Holy Spirit. This is what makes us sons and daughters of God. So the Holy Spirit first came to dwell with man as recorded in Acts chapter two. In Acts chapter two, you will see there in Acts chapter two, if we read from verse one to four, the Bible bears record of the first visitation of the Holy Spirit. So God promised to give the Holy Spirit to all those who ask him. Anyone who asks him, God promised to give his Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. That's why I'm saying that he's not by fasting. It's simply by asking God and believing by faith, knowing that God is faithful. That whatever God has said, God holds himself accountable and that holds true. Because it is impossible for God to lie. So whatever God says, he will do it. And so the Holy Spirit is given to all those who ask him through Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, 
it is recorded there that the first experience of the believers who received the Holy Spirit, and since then until now, those who believe have continued to receive the Holy Spirit. The same faith that you exercise in receiving salvation is the same faith you exercise in receiving the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. That's the same faith you exercise to experience salvation is the same faith you exercise to receive the Holy Spirit and his manifestation in power and righteousness and ministry and fellowship, like we mentioned, the four dimensions that the Holy Spirit helps us. It is important to make clarification around speaking in tongues because I know some people want to ask me, is speaking in tongues the only sign that one has received the Holy Spirit? According to that Acts portion, if we read it again, note it and read it for yourself, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. There the Bible makes it clear that when the Holy Ghost came upon the disciples who were waiting in the upper room, as Jesus told them to wait, they began to speak in tongues. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that I mentioned where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are mentioned. One of the gifts there is tongues and interpretation of tongues. So indeed, speaking in tongues is a sign of the Holy Spirit. It is very important. But let me make it very clear to everyone. There are people who have received the Holy Spirit but don't speak in tongues. There are people who have received the Holy Spirit but don't speak in tongues. Of course, you can see that in that same First Corinthians chapter 12, I believe verse 31, I believe from verse 31, Paul was asking that, he said, do all prophesy? Do all speak in tongues if you go further? However, note this, Paul there wasn't saying that anyone who desires to speak in tongues will not be able to speak in tongues if he has received the Holy Spirit. What happens is the limitation of us individually. So anybody who has received the Holy Spirit who doesn't speak in tongues, it is by your limitation. It's not because the Holy Spirit in you cannot enable you to speak in tongues. So let me make that clarification because often this question comes up. However, it is very important that you grow in that spirit so you can speak in tongues because speaking in tongues is a very powerful gift. Go to Romans chapter eight, verses 26 and 27. Romans chapter eight, verses 26 and 27. There you will see that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit helps us with intercession, interceding for us with groanings, uttering those things which we are unable to utter. There have been many situations and testimonies where a believer could not even pray and you just pray in tongues and the Holy Ghost takes over. It is a very powerful gift and blessing. So if you have restrained yourself, because as I said, it's purely by your restraint, either not knowing uh, or not releasing your faith for that experience, I will encourage you to learn. And I'm available, we can talk after this. That's point one to clarify. But even with such a person, you would then ask and say, what is the sign? The rest of the sign are there. And I'll tell you one key one. Then the Bible talks about the gifts, nine gifts. One key one that always will manifest and you need it, you need it, you need it, you need it, believers, is the one that is called the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. The word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. 
Oh, it is such an important gift. One prophet in the Old Testament that manifested this gift so powerfully, so admirably, and I would love us to just check through that so we see, is Elisha. Elisha. Elisha was a man that manifested this gift so powerfully. Praise the Lord. In Acts, I mean, sorry, in 2 Kings chapter 6, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 12, you remember the story here? It was when the king of Syria planned to attack, to have wait war against the king of Israel, against Israel as a whole, rather. And every time he made his plot and said he will keep his army here, Elisha will tell the king of Israel, he said, don't go that way. The king of Syria is planning to attack you. Not once, not twice, the Bible said, Elisha, through this gift of word of wisdom and word of knowledge, was able to foil the plot of the king of Syria. And the king of Syria was so angry and he thought, oh, there is a traitor in his camp. And he was asking his people. So his people said, no, 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 king. And that's what the verse 12 of 2 Kings chapter 6 is saying. He said, one of his servants said, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Wow. And this was just somebody whom the Holy Ghost visits and depart. Because as you will see in the book of John, John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39, John 7, 38 and 39, you will see there that the Bible says clearly they didn't have the spirit dwelling in them till Jesus came, whom the, who was born of the Holy Spirit. And in him, the Holy Spirit dwell fully. And Jesus said, as we read in uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he said, as I go, that same Holy Spirit will come and dwell in you and abide in you. That's who we are. That's the dispensation of the sons and daughters of God. So Elisha manifested by the Spirit of God. And you could imagine that level of manifestation. Uh, this is very important. So the point I was making is that even if you don't speak in tongues, there are many evidences that the gifts of the Holy Spirit dwells in you as listed there in first corinthians chapter 12. if you read all the way verse 1 all the way down i think from verse 7 it begins to list the gifts the key one that you would see is the gift of wisdom of course i define wisdom as knowing the right thing doing the right thing that brings the right result, wisdom and knowledge. And this gift is very important. It, it saves us a lot from, from danger. So let's continue to look at Elisha a little. So Elisha, in that same scripture, the king of Syria got angry and said, oh, who is this Elisha? Where does he live? They said he lives in Dothan. He said to his army, mobilize, go and attack him. This is one thing we must again know about our enemies. He doesn't stop attacking. Imagine a man who can hear your thoughts from your bedroom, wherever you are, wherever he is, he can hear your thoughts from your bedroom. Yet the enemy was not afraid. He mobilized his army to go and attack Elisha. So when he came, as of course you remember, Elisha struck them with blindness and led them to the king of, uh, of Israel. And 
From there, the army were fed and returned in, humili in humiliation to their king. And so when they got back to king, to their king, their king became very angry and decided that he is going to attack the whole of Samaria. If you know, by this time, Samaria was the capital of Israel. So when the king went to lay siege, there was great famine in Israel. People were hungry. The women began to eat their children. And the king couldn't hold it anymore. Of course, despite that, the king, Elisha helped save the king. At this time, the king said he will remove the head of Elisha because Elisha is the cause of this problem. And so that's what you see in verse 31. Then he said, God do so to me, and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. As he was saying that, follow the story in verse 32. Now see what happened. But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger come, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? Let me help us understand this. I hope somebody will be excited to begin to walk in the power of this Holy Spirit because it's just so wonderful. So, the king was planning to come and kill Elisha. And as he was planning, Elisha was with some people talking that even his servant that is coming is it is, is just a trick. The man himself is coming behind his servant. He knew. I decree over your life today that by the Holy Spirit, you will escape every plot of your enemy in the name of Jesus. By the Spirit of God, you will escape every plot of, the, of your enemies in the name mighty name of Jesus. So it's very important gift, having the wisdom and the knowledge of God. There are many other uh, manifestation of the Holy Spirit listed there. So the point here is, let's not get hung on, on the speaking in tongues, but let's train ourselves up to speak in tongues because it is important. But anyone who has the Holy Spirit, at least wisdom will begin to manifest. The wisdom will begin to manifest. I've seen it severally in my life, especially when there are challenging, challenging situations. So Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14, please note this scripture. So you know what we're talking about. How do you receive and exercise and walk in this power? It is by exercising, exercising your faith. Hebrews 5.14 says, but strong meats are for those who are mature through the exercising of their senses to discern between good and evil. But strong meats are for those who are mature, who through usage, through usage, have developed their senses, exercise their senses to discern between good and evil. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. So why I told us the story of Elisha is so you can understand the extent to which you can grow in the spirit. And this is what we mean by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's step back then and just quickly look at receiving the Holy Spirit along the lines that we were sharing. Uh, they are really, uh, so you receive and then you exercise. As you exercise, you grow. As we have just illustrated through the experience of the uh, old time prophet Elisha. 
So the Bible says in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? I believe the unequivocal answer to that is no. Or if he shall ask him egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is it. This is the scripture. God is faithful, incomparably faithful to any human being. But the scripture makes it clear here that is it God that it God is more willing to give his holy spirit to anyone who asks him through Jesus Christ his son than we are willing to give egg or bread or fish to our children so what steps then do we take to ask God for the holy spirit we use that same model that we talked about b r r b l that's the model. Repent, believe, and receive Jesus Christ, as we have already said and taught in this book. Uh, for the book that I shared with you, you can refer to that, the last page. Then ask God to give you the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Ask God to give you the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he said, the promise of the Father will come. From the day that the Holy Ghost came upon the disciples of old, oh, that Holy Spirit has remained here with us. He hasn't left. He is available. Where you are right now, the Holy Spirit is with you. If you can open your heart and just believe and ask, he will come in. It will come into your heart. It will come into your life. The Bible makes it clear that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple. That's where he dwells. So exercise faith by believing God that he is faithful and has given you the Holy Spirit as he has promised through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is what Jesus said to the disciples as we read earlier. In that John chapter 14, verses 14 through 18, he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Perhaps your faith is uh, weak. You should also ask a fellow Christian who has received the Holy Spirit with the with with manifesting the signs of the spirit especially speaking in tongues invite such a christian to lay hands on you you will see this example demonstrated in acts chapter 19 acts chapter 19 verses 1 to 7 there paul met some disciples Again, this point around disciples who are not yet Christians because they have not received the Holy Spirit. There are many such people. They are following the Bible. They are practicing, but they deny the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, nobody is a Christian. And without the Holy Spirit, nobody is of Christ. It is only by the Holy Spirit. You may challenge me and say, ah, but you just said there are works of uh, mercy. Yes, there are, but those works of mercy are only also recognized when they are done by the Spirit of God. Why? Because 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, if even if I give my body to be burnt, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. 
So you can see, we are not in competition at all with the world to do the things that they do. And he asked them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? They said, we have never heard of what the Holy Spirit is. And in case there are people here who have been struggling in that space, now you hear of him, he's available to you, and he will impart you right now in the name of Jesus. And so Paul said, in, by whose baptism then were you baptized? He said, the baptism of John. And Paul baptized them, and he laid hands on them. That's the example that I'm just talking about. He laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit and began to prophesy. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. You see these examples all through the scripture. Last example, Peter in the house of Cornelius, Acts chapter 10, you will see this from verse 44 to 46, and also in Acts chapter 11. Peter in the house of Cornelius. Peter said, while I was yet speaking, as he was preaching Jesus Christ, telling them, about how repentance comes through Jesus Christ. How God has anointed him in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. As he continued to talk to them about Jesus, the Bible says the Holy Ghost fell upon them. These were Gentiles, brothers and sisters. These were not Jews, Gentiles. The Holy Ghost fell upon them. Nobody laid hands on them. They only heard the word of faith and they believed and the Holy Ghost fell upon them. This is how we receive the Holy Spirit. Let me summarize. So when we believe in Jesus Christ, repent of our sins, we simply ask God, the Father, to give us his Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus. According to Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. When we have done that, we should exercise our faith according to the word of God, believing that what God says is true. And the Holy Spirit will begin to manifest in us. We should also then seek like the Paul's example I have shared with us. If you somehow don't feel sure, you see how our God is loving. It does nothing, um, that, oh, um, I, I don't feel sure. Um, then, then you feel like condemning yourself. No, it isn't so. That's why I told us about Hebrews 5.14. It said, but strong meat are for those who through usage have exercised their senses to design between good and evil. How do we walk in power? As you have seen the sign, the example of Elijah. It is by exercising. It is by exercising. Doing those things Jesus Christ said we will do. So I want to wrap up here by looking at that John chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. John chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. There Jesus said, if you believe in me, Anyone who believes in me, the works that I do, will he do also. Even greater works than this, because I go to my father. Verse 13 added, he said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So when Jesus called the disciples while he was here on earth, he gave them authority and sent them out. And they cast, casted out devils. They healed the sick. He told them, raise the dead. This 
are the works that Jesus Christ said we will also do. And so when we're talking about walking in power of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, simply it is by you exercising your faith and learning, learning by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to many of us, but we don't hear because we have not uh, 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 um, train ourselves, as that Hebrews 5, 14 said, train ourselves. So you need to train yourself. It is basically you knowing I have the Holy Spirit. It's a consciousness in you and then stepping out. To conclude my own testimonies, and this happens almost on daily basis, even this morning, a sister just called me up and said, I have been sick. And I said, no problem. I pray for you. Put up the phone. By the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. You are healed now and you remain healed forever. Be healed in Jesus name. How does it feel? Oh, I feel better now. She says she couldn't breathe. I say breathe that way she breathed, she would choke. I say breathe seven times and she breathed seven times. No choking. So brothers and sisters, the spirit of God is available to you, is available to me. That is the Holy Spirit that God has sent. Jesus was uh, glorified. Jesus has ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit has come and he is here with us. Receive him, the Holy Spirit. Ask God in faith and go on, exercise the faith. And more importantly, be conscious of the fact that the Holy Spirit is in you and is with you. That's the key, the consciousness. Most times we walk without that consciousness. It is the consciousness and you constantly fellowshipping with him, the Holy Spirit. And as I said, the gift of speaking in tongues is important because it helps edifies you. It helps you pray those moments where you don't, when you don't know what to pray. And so train up yourself and ask for a brother, a sister, to pray with you so you will experience that gift, that blessing, and be able to pray. Thank you for listening, and God bless you.